Um, so, so far we have talked about sort of the three lines of defense. And so remember our first line of defense is part of our innate defenses. That means we're born with them. This is gonna include our skin and our membranes. Okay, and we talked a lot about this. Um, we talked about how we have things like the acid mantle and secretions that help to control bacterial growth on the surface of our skin. But again, remember, our skin's not foolproof. It is a continuous barrier, but we can cut our skin and things can get through. And so our second line of defense is also part of our innate defenses. And this is gonna include a whole host of things, anything from natural killer cells to inflammation, to pyrogens, to complement proteins. We have a whole host of things. These are just a few. And again, remember, these are innate. That means that they are, we, have, we are born with these, okay? And then we also have that third line of defense, and this is what is considered our adaptive defenses. These are the ones that we can improve over time. You know, when you think about building your immune system, this is what you're thinking about. And the adaptive defenses are what we think of when we think of the immune system. And these include things like our B cells. We talked about these last week. Remember, these provide us with humoral immunity. That means that it protects basically our body's fluids. So remember, B cells make antibodies. And the antibodies float around in your body's humors. So blood plasma, lymphatic fluid, tissue fluid, antibodies float around in your body's humors and they flag free floating foreign organisms for destruction. The way I kind of think of antibodies is kind of like mittens, you know, like you can't do a lot when you're wearing mittens. So antibodies sort of act like mittens for these free floating foreign organisms. They kind of latch on and it turns that free floating organism into a pair of mittens and it can't grab on and infect body cells that way. Um, and those antibodies have now flagged those free floating organisms for destruction. And we walk through the different ways that we can destroy those free floating organisms through things like agglutination and precipitation, okay? And then we also have our T cells. And our T cells provide us with a different kind of immunity called cellular immunity. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. T cells are going to go after infected body cells. So these are body cells that have gone awry and become cancer cells or body cells that have been infected by a foreign antigen or a foreign organism. And T cells are going to kill that body cell um, before the infection can spread, okay? So that's kind of where we left off. Whoops. Sorry. Okay. So we left off here talking about our T cells. So again, I told you that your T cells provide us with cellular immunity. So antigen or antibodies are pretty much useless for a foreign antigen that has already gotten into a body cell. So we say antibodies are useless against intracellular antigens. So that means a body cell that has been infected by a foreign organism, antibodies are useless for that. So that's what our T cells are for. And so we say cell-mediated immunity, our T cells, are necessary. Um, we have to have T cells so that we can kill off infected body cells and prevent that infection from spreading. So that's why they focus on keeping the T cell count up for people with HIV. Yeah, so that's a little different. We'll talk a little bit about HIV. Um, HIV is a virus. We have different kinds of T cells. So we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and so with HIV, it's a virus that infects one of the types of T cells. So they can look at that particular type of T cell and how many you have in your body and tell how far the virus has progressed. Does that make sense? 
So T cells are blind to free floating foreign antigens. Okay, so if you've got this free floating bacteria in your body, a T cell can't see it. That's what antibodies go after, right? A T cell can't see that. It can only see an infected body cell or a body cell that has gone awry. So they only have the ability to see and respond to infected body cells. And how they do that is remember, you've seen this picture before. So remember when a body cell is infected by this foreign organism here, it's into that body cell, that body cell will take the foreign antigen on its surface, these little red dots, and display it on the MHC protein. This cell now becomes what's called an antigen presenting cell or an APC. Whoops. That is the only way a T cell knows a body cell has been infected. And that's the only way that a T cell can respond to that body cell. So T cells, what are they going to target? They're going to target body cells that have been infected with, whoops, with a virus. With viruses, body cells that have been infected with bacteria or intracellular parasites like malaria. They'll also respond to body cells that have gone awry. So body cells that look different. Um, so a great example that I'll use is cancer cells. Cancer cells genetically have become modified in your body. Genetically, we normally have DNA that tells our cells how often to divide and replicate, how often to go through mitosis. If those genes get turned on or off, it's gonna cause those cells to divide too quickly, and that is cancer. Those cells have been genetically modified to the point of usually the antigens on the surface will look different. And so these are abnormal or cancer cells. This is how T cells know, hey, those look different. Those don't belong. And then cells with foreign antigens on the surface, like body cells, transplanted cells. Remember, our self antigen is self only to you. My self antigen is self only to me. If you took my kidney out and we gave it to Kamisha, it's not her body cells. They're, it's going to look different to her. And so that sugar coating on the surface of all those cells, her body is going to recognize as foreign, okay? So T cells will recognize foreign tissue as well, like transplants. So for T cells to go after a body cell, whether it's been infected or it's gone awry and become cancerous or it's uh, transplanted tissue, in order for a T cell to be activated, it's a two-step process. That's actually important. You want it to be a two-step process because you don't want T cells to just start fighting off healthy body cells, right? So the two steps are antigen binding. So it's got to bind to the antigen on the surface and then co-stimulation. Both of these happen on the surface of that antigen presenting cell. So let me show you a picture here. Um, so what we can see here is this is a body cell, this purple one. This is a dendritic body cell. And it has gobbled up this bacteria. So now it's inside. And it takes that foreign antigen and puts it on that MHC protein on the surface. So now it becomes an antigen presenting cell. So here comes the T cell in blue. And it's going to bind. You can see that it has bound right here okay, to the MHC protein. It has bound to that foreign antigen. So what we say is that antigen binding, this first step, is like starting the car, right? You get in your car, you push the button, you turn the key, you start your car. That's what antigen binding is like. The T cells are going to recognize that there's a foreign antigen being presented on that MHC protein. The second step is co-stimulation. This one puts the car in here. It's going to put it into drive. So this is a two-step process. T cells have to bind to the antigen that's turning the car on. Then they have to be co-stimulated, which puts the car in gear and gets those T cells activated. 
And so this is basically, co-stimulation is basically just that that T cell has to bind to other surface receptors on the antigen presenting cell. Um, and this is going to cause the T cell to start to proliferate. Remember, proliferate just means to make copies of itself. So one type of chemical called cytokines, these get released by antigen presenting cells or even by T cells. These are chemicals that help with the proliferation of those T cells. So again, let's go back to this picture. So you can see step one here, the T cell binding to that foreign antigen on the antigen presenting cell, that's turning the car on. And then co-stimulation is co-stimulatory molecules, which you can see here. Okay, so you can see that co-stimulation is binding to other molecules. That's causing the release of cytokines and it causes these T cells to start to proliferate, make lots of copies of themselves. So it's like a double handshake. Now I want to talk about those chemicals that cause that proliferation, these cytokines. Um, cytokines can influence things like cell development, even differentiation. <laughs> Bless you. And the two cytokines that play a huge role and the proliferation of our T cells are interleukins. Okay, that should sound familiar. We talked a little bit about interleukins that help with causing more white blood cells. And then also interferons, which we've already talked about. Interferons interfere with viral replication. Um, T cells that are activated. So after they've gone through that two-step process, they've become activated. They're gonna enlarge and proliferate because of those cytokines being released. And then they're gonna differentiate and they're gonna perform different functions depending on what type of T cell they become. So we actually have, and I mentioned this earlier when Kamisha asked the question about HIV, we actually have four different kinds of T cells. So I'm gonna walk you through those in just a little bit. Now, typically um, the primary T cell response will peak within about seven days. After that, we've got to turn off our T cells. We've got to kill them and get rid of them. And that'll happen between days seven and 30. Anytime we're killing off a T cell or any cell in our body, the term for that is apoptosis. Do y'all remember the actual definition of apoptosis from general biology? Sudden cell death. Okay, so T cell apoptosis. We got to kill those T cells. There is a reason for that. I want you to think of what T cells are fighting. They are fighting infected body cells. They are fighting your own body cells, your own body tissue. So activated T cells are actually a hazard. They produce a large amount of inflammatory chemicals like cytokines that can lead to things like cancer. We don't want them to start um, um, going after healthy body cells. So it's really important that once that infection of, has been um, taken care of, that we get rid of these activated T cells. So that's why there is always going to be a ramp up. It takes about seven days to activate, get those T cells activated, get rid of that infection. And then after seven days, we got to start killing those T cells off because you don't want them hanging around. Um, now, just like with B cells, you do create memory T cells that'll activate and mediate that secondary immune response much faster. So just like with B cells, memory T cells hang around in the body for years. Um, and the next time they see that exact same foreign antigen, they can fight it off incredibly quickly. So T cells, um, the four types of T cells that we have in the body, are listed here, okay? So the first type that we'll talk about are called CD4 cells, T4 cells, or helper T cells. It is all the same thing. <coughs> this chapter in your textbook, have y'all tried to read this chapter yet in your book? It's rough, it is a rough read because your textbook uses these terms all interchangeably. So you'll read one paragraph where they will call these CD4 cells, You'll read another paragraph where they refer to them as T4 cells, and then another one they'll talk about them as helper T cells. So it makes it really complicated. 
I'll typically refer to these in what I have in red. So I will typically refer to these as helper T cells. If I ask you a question on an exam where it's something like T4 cells, I'll put in parentheses helper T cells. So you know. Helper T cells. These are a type of T cell that literally helps the immune system. These are a type of T cell that will activate every other type of T cell. It will also activate B cells and even macrophages. So helper T cells, you know, I know that I've been saying for our three lines of defense, you know, I, I keep saying our third line of defense is really the immune system. That's what you think of when you think of the immune system. In reality, if we don't have helper T cells, you don't have an immune system. You can't fight infections. So, Kamisha, to get back to your question about HIV, people who have HIV, this is a virus that specifically targets helper T cells, and it makes them inactive. And so this is why people with HIV don't die from HIV. They die from opportunistic infections that healthy people do not get. They die from infections that healthy people can fight off easily. Someone with HIV or AIDS can't fight it off because their helper T cell count is so low that they are so immunocompromised. All right, so we'll talk more about these. Another type of T cell we have are CD8, T8, or cytotoxic T cells. Again, I'll typically call them cytotoxic T cells. Again, I like the, this term because it is very descriptive of what it's doing. What does cyto mean? Or cite? Means cell, cite means cell, and toxic, deadly. So these are the T cells that are destroying the infected body cells. So these are really the workhorses. These are the ones where you have a virus that's infected a body cell, it is a cytotoxic T cell that will kill that body cell. Right. We also have regulatory T cells. Um, when I was going through anatomy years and years ago, we used to call these suppressor T cells. I like that term because it tells you what they're doing. Regulatory T cells basically stop T cell proliferation as the antigen levels decline. So remember, I told you on the previous slide that once after about seven days once our t cells have really gotten the infection under control we need to kill off those t cells we need to make them go through apoptosis kill them off we don't want activated t cells floating around in our body when we don't have an active infection that's what regulatory t cells do they turn off that immune response and then lastly are our memory t cells just like memory b cells these are important in the secondary immune response Okay, so these are our different kinds of T cells. So this is just showing you the process of maturation of these T cells. So we start with the lymphocyte. Remember B cells and T cells, these are just lymphocytes, a type of white blood cell that comes from our red bone marrow. And what we find is that um, those lymphocytes, in order to become mature T cells, they go to the thymus. So remember, T for thymus. This is where they go to become mature. And in the thymus, they're put through a series of tests so that we know that the, the T cells that are getting out in circulation are not going to go after healthy body cells. So we can see here through this process of maturation, we produce things like cytotoxic T cells, we produce things like helper T cells, regulatory T cells, and then through an active infection, we'll make memory T cells. So those are our four different kinds of T cells. So I'm going to walk you through each of those four types of T cells. We're going to start with our helper T cells. Helper T cells play a huge role in your immune system. Again, when we think of the immune system, uh, these are the ones, without these, you don't have an immune system. Um, because these play a huge role in beefing up all the other numbers of T cells that we have. So cytotoxic T cells, um, regulatory T cells, memory T cells, 
but they also play a huge role in activating your B cells as well. So these are really important. So they activate both humoral and cellular arms of that adaptive immune system. Once they see that foreign antigen, so once a helper T cell sees a foreign antigen presented on an antigen presenting cell, they help to activate and proliferate T cells and B cells. They release cytokines, which recruit other immune system cells. And they also activate macrophages. So again, like I said, without help for T cells, you don't have an immune response. These truly help the immune system. How do helper T cells activate B cells? How are they helping with that process? They actually interact directly with B cells. Um, remember, um, you may not remember when we started this chapter, I told, we talked about antigen presenting cells. And I told you that these are the cells that gobble up foreign organism, and then they put that foreign antigen on the MHC protein, okay, on the surface, and they become an antigen presenting cell. And I told you we have different antigen presenting cells. We have like Langerhans cells, dendritic cells. B cells can also act as antigen presenting cells. So anytime a B cell is acting as an antigen presenting cell, and it's showing a helper T cell, hey, this is a foreign antigen, and this does not belong, it's gonna stimulate, it's gonna help to stimulate those B cells to divide more rapidly and make antibodies faster. So the helper T cell is actually gonna help that B cell divide faster. So B cells want to show helper T cells what they've found, okay, so they can be activated faster. Um, B cells can be activated without helper T cells, but the response is much weaker and much shorter lived. So helper T cells really boost the B cell response. Most antigens require co-stimulation from a helper T cell. So we call these T cell dependent antigens. So this is just showing you up here. You can see in blue, this is our helper T cell. And in purple at the bottom, this is our B cell. So that B cell is acting, in this case, as an antigen presenting cell. This is our antigen presenting cell. It has put that foreign antigen on the MHC protein, and it is showing that helper T cell, look what we have. And just like we talked about earlier, remember it's that two-step process. It binds to that foreign antigen, and then there's that co-stimulation and then that helper T cell starts releasing some chemicals that allow this B cell to proliferate faster, to make antibodies faster. And we also have cytotoxic T cells. These are the only T cells that will directly attack and kill an infected body cell. These are gonna circulate through your blood, your lymphatic fluid, lymphatic organs, and they're gonna search for any body cell that is displaying an antigen that they recognize as foreign. So again, the target of a cytotoxic T cell is an intracellular pathogen. It is something that's gotten into a body cell. So this might be a body cell infected with a virus. It might be a body cell infected with a parasite or bacteria. It might be body cells that have gone awry and become cancerous, or it might be body cells that don't belong in your body. Okay, so this would be like transfusions or transplants. Now, how do cytotoxic T cells work? How do they kill off body cells? Typically, when they see a body cell that is presenting this foreign antigen on the surface that doesn't belong, it's going to dock with that body cell. And you can see in this picture, let's, uh, we'll start with this one down here. This is a scanning electron micrograph image. We can see the T cell here. This is our cytotoxic T cell. And this down here at the bottom, this is our body cell. I know it's kind of hard to see. And let me show you this picture. So you can see this one over here on the right. This is a scanning electron micrograph, but it's in color. So again, you can see the T cell, and then you can see this infected body cell. In this case, this is a cancer cell. So it looks different. So when we say that this T cell docks 
with the body cell that's infected. Do you see what we mean here? It literally looks like that T cell is grabbing onto it. It's gonna hold onto it, okay? Then that T cell is actually gonna release two different kinds of chemicals. One is called perforin. What does that sound like, perforin? Perforated, right? So what, like perforated, what does that mean? Perforated paper, what's it mean? It has little holes, right? When you buy a notebook paper that's perforated, it means that you can tear it off and have that clean sheet, so little tiny holes. So perforins create little tiny holes that allow enzymes to get into that target cell. And the enzymes are called granzymes. Granzymes are a type of enzyme that stimulates apoptosis. So now let's look back at this picture. And this time we're gonna look at the image over here on the left. Okay, so it's the same thing. They try to keep the colors the same. Here's a cytotoxic T cell in purple. You can see that it's docking with that yellow body cell, that target cell. And now we're gonna look up close at where those two cells are meeting here at this image. And you can see here we have a vesicle that's gonna contain some perforins. And so you can see those perforins get released and notice what they're doing. They're coming together and they're punching little holes in the plasma membrane of that body cell. And then through those little holes, granzymes get released and those stimulate apoptosis of that cell. Now, our third type of T cell is a regulatory T cell. Again, this is going to turn off T cell production, shuts down that immune response, causes apoptosis. This is really important in preventing things like autoimmune reactions. We do not want our immune system to attack ourselves. Autoimmune means that your immune system attacks self antigens instead of foreign antigens. And because T cells are going after body cells, the last thing you want is for them to attack your own body cells. So it really keeps the immune system from running out of control. Um, so there is a lot of research being done into using these regulatory T cells to kind of suppress the immune system and allow for tolerance of transplanted organs. This could be really helpful for patients who've received an organ transplant. So I wanna walk you through in this image what's going on. So you can see here, I really like this picture because it kind of puts the immune system all together. So you can see here, we've got this foreign antigen that gets in the body. So that's at the very top, okay? So here's our foreign antigen. And remember we have our innate and our adaptive defenses. So remember the innate defenses you are born with. So this would be things like your skin and your membranes. And then some internal defenses like complement proteins, natural killer cells, inflammatory response. Those are our first and second line of defense. But if things make it past the first line of defense, past our skin, remember our second and third line of defense are activated at the same time. It's just the third line of defense takes a little longer to get there. And that is our adaptive defenses. And so what we can see here in this image this is showing you over here in um, this sort of green color. This is humoral immunity. This is what B cells are doing. You have these free floating organisms here. So those are floating in blood plasma or lymphatic fluid. You can see this B cell recognizes that very particular foreign antigen, makes clones, makes plasma cells, and pumps out antibodies to it. The antibodies will then flag those free floating foreign organisms for destruction. In the process, remember it also makes memory. On the other side, in that sort of um, tan color, this is showing you here's that organism that's gotten into a body cell that then has been engulfed by a dendritic cell. Dendritic cells are a type of antigen presenting cell. That dendritic cell is going to present that foreign antigen on its surface. And it's going to find the T cell and it's going to show a T cell. And so this is going to activate our T4 cells, our helper T cells. And the helper T cells, I want you to look at these teal cells, 
right? The ones that are here. They're going to help activate cytotoxic T cells. They are also coming over here and activating B cells. Because remember, they help the immune response. These cytotoxic T cells become activated. They're going to fight off infected body cells. They're going to kill them off. Remember, they're going to grab the cell. They're going to release perforins and granzymes. They're going to kill that cell. Okay, so those are our cytotoxic T cells. So I like that because it puts both of those arms of the immune system together. Now, the last type of T cell we have are memory T cells. Again, these are gonna come when T cells are activated during that primary response, and they are responsible for cellular immunity and the memory that we find with cellular immunity. And just like with memory B cells, these activate very quickly during a subsequent infection with the same antigen, okay? And so I know I've mentioned this a lot. I know I've talked about how our adaptive immune system is very specific, okay? So I wanna to touch on that a little bit more. Um, think of like shoes, I'm not really a shoe person, but think of like tennis shoes. Like let's pretend you're infected with a virus that's like the Nike Air Force One virus. Okay. You have immune system cells that only recognize Nike Air Force One viruses, okay? And they're going to kill it off, and they're going to create memory for that. And if you're ever infected with Nike Air Force One again, you have memory, you fight it off very fast. They do nothing to protect you from the Adidas virus. If you get the Adidas virus, that looks totally different. You have other cells that will mount an attack for that, okay? They'll create memory to that. Now, let's say, for example, you are infected with the Nike Air Force 2 virus. It's going to look a little similar to Nike Air Force 1, so you might have a little bit of protection, um, but it's still different. And so you're still going to have to ramp up immunity to that. Okay? And so I like to mention that because that's really similar to what's happening with coronavirus. So with coronavirus, the original variant, COVID-19, now we have different spinoff variants, right? We have like the Delta variant. So this would be like COVID-19 is like the Nike Air Force One and the Delta variants like Nike Air Force Two. Kind of similar, but it's still different. So if you've got COVID-19 and you have natural antibodies to it, or if you have the vaccine for COVID-19, if you get infected with the Delta virus, you're, you may still have symptoms. You may still feel crappy. Um, but you're probably going to do a better job of fighting it off than if you didn't have any antibodies or memory to begin with, either from the vaccine or natural antibodies. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is just a little table that walks you through the different kinds of cells that we have in our adaptive defenses. Okay, so we've got our B cells, Again, remember, let's think of where all these different cells are created. They are all created in our bone marrow, every one of these. So um, they're all made in our bone marrow. Okay? They're all lymphocytes, all made in bone marrow. Where do they mature? Remember B for bone marrow. So B cells mature in the bone marrow. T for thymus. T cells, all of our T cells mature in the thymus. The target for these, remember B cells, free floating foreign organisms. T cells are going after infected body cells. And they do this by using these antigen <coughs> presenting cells. And then the action of these. Now they all have different actions that we've walked through. Um, we talked about all of these, whether we were looking at our B cells or we were looking at our different T cells. So this might be a pretty helpful little graph that you can look at as you're studying. Make sure that you understand the difference between these types of cells. Now, I do want to talk a little bit, because we've mentioned this with our T cells, I do want to talk a little bit about organ transplants. So we have different kinds of transplants that people can get. Auto graft, the term auto means self. So this is an auto graft is when you are taking an organ or some tissue from one part of your body and putting it somewhere else, okay? It's a self graft. So this would be like if you have to have a ligament graft 
or sometimes they'll do bone grafts where they'll actually take bone from your hip and they'll put it somewhere where you need it. You're using your own body's tissues. Okay, that's an autograft. There is virtually, other than getting an infection, there is no risk of you of your immune system attacking an autograft because it is yourself. We also have isographs. Iso means same. So an isograft is a graft of a tissue or an organ between identical twins. Identical twins are genetically identical. They actually, how identical twins form is one sperm and one egg. The sperm fertilizes the egg. And during the process of those cells going through mitosis and creating a big ball of cells, it splits and creates two big ball of cells. But genetically, they're identical. And those two ball of cells will then form babies that are genetically identical, okay? Um, so obviously an isograft is pretty rare. You've gotta have an identical twin in order to have one. An allograft, an allograft is much more common. Allografts are between individuals who are not identical twins. Sometimes they're not even related to each other. And then lastly are xenografts. And xenografts are when you get a transplant of tissue that's coming from another species. So it might be cow or pig. We use these a lot in things like valves, like heart valves. Sometimes they'll use pig valves. And in terms of the success of an organ transplant, Obviously, it's going to depend on the similarity of the tissue. Autograft and isografts are the ideal donors. So either coming from yourself or coming from an identical twin, because these are almost always successful. As long as you have a good blood supply and as long as you don't get an infection, there's virtually no chance of rejecting them. Now, there's a lot of research they're doing into xenografts. Again, these are the ones coming from animals. But the most common form of an organ transplant is an allograft. Now, you know, you've heard of people say, well, you've got to find a good match. You've got to find a good match. Or, you know, hospitals will call and say, hey, we have found a match for your patient. patient. What does that mean? A good match means blood type has to match. So the ABO blood type has to be the same. If I'm being negative, I have to be able to get a transplant from someone who's being negative. There are some other blood antigens that have to match that they're looking for. And lastly, the MHC antigen has to match as closely as possible so that you don't mount an immune response. Okay, so those are the three things. You may want to start at, so I might ask you something about that later. Now, after someone has had an organ transplant, that patient is typically treated with immunosuppressants. So their immune system is suppressed. They're given steroids to suppress inflammation because remember, I want you to think back to our immune system. Part of that second line of defense is the inflammatory response. And the inflammatory response triggers our third line of defense. It triggers our B cells and T cells. So if they don't want your immune system attacking a transplant, they don't want you to swell. So they're going to give you steroids to prevent swelling. They'll give you drugs to prevent proliferation of B cells and T cells. And they'll give you immunosuppressant drugs. Um, I didn't realize this a couple of years ago. I had a student whose sister had to have a liver transplant. And she said um, that she had her transplant at UAB. And um, it immediately after the transplant, she was only in the hospital for like 24 hours. Immediately afterwards, they moved her into an apartment. And this is what the transplant team does. They moved her into this apartment that had been clean and sterilized. And then they trained three family members how to clean her wound, how to clean her drains, how to clean her up, how to take care of her. And the thought process there is, the last place we want to transplant patient who's on immunosuppressants, who's on anti-proliferative drugs is in a hospital because that's the dirtiest place you're ever going to be. It has the most resistant bacteria and, and nasty germs that you can find. So they want to get those patients out of the hospital. 
They also don't want to have nurses in and out of that patient's room. I had a C-section when I had my son and I was only in the hospital for three days and I never had the same nurse. So for every shift, it was a different nurse. So you can imagine how many patients nurses are seeing and then they're coming back to this patient. And then let's say they have a sick child at home. Well, if you have a sick kid at home, but you feel fine and maybe your husband's staying home, you'll go on to work. You can't have that when you have a transplant patient. You've got to have healthy people. So the thought is let's train like three or four family members, make sure they know how to clean them, make sure they know how to clean those drains. And that way, if, you know, if, if my mom had to have a transplant and my child is sick, I'm going to call the other three people that are helping to take care of her and say, hey, listen, Graham is sick. I can't come take care of mama because I don't want to get her sick. So everyone else pitches in. So there's a lot greater level of care there. Um, and I didn't realize that they were doing that, but I think that's a really great thing. Now, there's a lot of problems when you put someone on immunosuppressants. Um, when you suppress the immune system, truly means that that patient cannot protect themselves from foreign antigens. So little infections that you could typically fight off um, can become life-threatening. They can lead to death. And so it's really important doctors, after a patient's had a transplant, they really have to balance the amount of um, immunosuppressants they're getting so that the graft takes or the transplant takes, but that the patient can remain healthy. Um, usually patients who've had an organ transplant will reject that organ within 10 years. So there's a 50% rejection rate within 10 years. And there's a lot of research uh, that they're doing looking at how patients can tolerate organ transplants better. Um, one thing is um, developing what's called a chimeric immune system. So chimeric means dual or two-sided. I'll write both up here. And so what they do is, let's say they found a good match for somebody. Uh, blood type is the same, MH protein, MHC proteins are really similar, and other blood proteins are very similar. Um, what they'll do is they will suppress the patient <coughs> or the recipient's bone marrow. Okay, so they'll suppress the bone marrow, and then they're going to douse that patient's bone marrow with the bone marrow of the donor, where the new organ is coming from. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to induce this sort of dual immune system, a combined immune system that's a little bit from the patient and a little bit coming from the donor. And that's in, in the hopes that they will not reject that new organ or transplant. Okay. Um, so we've made it through basically the immune system, talking about our first or second or third line of defense, a little bit on transplant. Um, I do want to spend some time talking about things like immunodeficiencies, and also we'll talk a little bit about allergies and asthma. You guys okay so far? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some immunodeficiencies. Uh, we'll talk about some congenital ones. These are ones that you can be born with. We'll also talk about acquired immunodeficiencies like AIDS. That's what it stands for. Um, so we'll start with some congenital immunodeficiencies. There's one called SCID, which stands for Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Syndrome. This is a genetic defect. It causes babies um, to basically, they don't make enough B cells and T cells. The reason is they ha don't have the enzyme necessary to create those cells. And um, it actually creates products that are lethal to the T cells that they are generated. So basically what happens is when babies are born with SCID, they have no immune system at all, no functioning immune system and no hope of having a functioning immune system. And this can be fatal if it's untreated. Usually this has to be treated with a bone marrow transplant in the first month of life, so very early. Again, the reason why we're doing a bone marrow transplant is because, I, again, I want you to think about where white blood cells are forming. Form in your bone marrow. These are lymphocytes. Right? They form in the bone marrow. So they're going to wipe out your bone marrow and give you somebody else's. 
Um, and acquired um, immune deficiency syndrome would be like AIDS. Um, AIDS is a virus that infects helper T cells. Um, <clears throat> when someone has full blown AIDS, um, it causes weight loss, night sweats, swollen lymph nodes. Um, and usually people don't die from AIDS. What happens because this virus is affecting the helper T cells, they die from opportunistic infections that healthy people would not ever have. Um, so pneumocystis pneumonia is one. Another is something called Kaposi's sarcoma. This is basically like skin lesions. It's a type of cancer on the skin that can also form inter on internal organs. Um, again, this is not something we see in patients that are healthy, only in those that are immunocompromised. Um, this is uh, showing you Kaposi's sarcoma. It's characterized by these lesions. Again, these lesions are not just on the outside. They're all over internal organs, including the nervous system, so brain and spinal cord. Um, you can see the, uh, there is, towards the end of someone's life with, who is, has AIDS, a lot of times they go through what's called AIDS wasting, where they lose tre a tremendous amount of weight. Um, again, this is caused by a virus called human immunodeficiency virus. Um, it is transmitted by body fluid, so by blood, semen, and vaginal secretions. Um, it gets into the body lots of different ways. Um, through It used to be through blood, well, you can still get it through blood transfusions, but now we have tests that um, really screen for HIV. Uh, when we didn't know much about HIV, so like in the early 80s when it was first kind of coming onto the scene, especially out in California um, and in New York, where we saw it most. Um, we didn't really know much about it. In fact, they called it the gay man's disease. They thought it was only in gay men, and that's the only people who could have it. And then they started seeing it in people who were hemophiliacs, so people who were getting blood transfusions because it was being passed through blood that had been donated by someone who was HIV positive. Um, and so a lot of people who were hemophiliacs in the 80s actually died from full-blown AIDS. Um, blood contaminated needles. Um, and because of this, we've seen some different things in different cities. Um, we've seen things called the needle exchange program where drug addicts can come in um, with a dirty contaminated needle and trade it out for a clean needle free of charge, no questions asked. Um, the needle exchange program is what that's called. And the whole point of that was to try to cut down on the transmission of HIV um, because it was such a problem. Um, obviously, we can get it through sexual intercourse, including oral sex. It can also be passed from mother to fetus. Um, HIV, I mentioned, it is a virus that targets helper T cells. So it destroys helper T cells, which again, remember the name, helper T cells. They boost every other arm of the immune system every other type of T cell and B cells. So without these, you have no immune response. Um, HIV is a virus that will multiply in the lymph nodes during the asymptomatic period. Um, and then usually when the immune system starts to collapse is when we'll see symptoms. Um, usually it can be anywhere from a few months to 10 years before patients see symptoms. Now, the virus will also infect the brain, so it gets into the brain and spinal cord, so dementia is really common in people who are HIV positive, and it attaches to helper T cells. Um, HIV gets into a cell, it takes over the DNA of a cell, um, and it causes the host to make more viral RNA and proteins, and that allows the virus to reproduce, and this is typical of lots of viruses. Um, however, uh, we don't see, in terms of HIV, we don't have a cure for this, and we do have lots of different kinds of uh, medications that we give people who are HIV positive, but there really is no cure, um, and because HIV has such a high replication rate, um, it also means that it has a high mutation rate. Every time the virus replicates, it has the ability to mutate. So the whole point of a drug regimen for someone who's HIV positive is to really keep viral replication down um, and keep mutation rates down. They've seen that HIV can mutate over a hundred times in 
one patient in one year who is not getting any kind of medication. Um, there was uh, the um, NIH, has, National Institute of Health has some um, fabulous videos on HIV and they um, were interviewing a nurse, a male nurse who was HIV positive and kind of, he walks through sort of how he discovers he's HIV positive and then through his drug regimen. And, um, you know, as a nurse, he knew how important it was to stick with this drug regimen. And he talks about how difficult it is. He's got to take, you know, a zillion pills throughout the day. Um, he has to do injections. The injections have to be kept cold. He has to take these medicines at the exact time. So he said he has timers and stopwatches going off all the time so that he can make sure he takes his medicine. And he said it was through no fault of his own, but a pharmacy error. They gave him half dose pills um, and he didn't realize it. It took two days before he realized it. Um, he was taking his medicine, um, but in those two days, the virus replicated, mutated, and his drug regimen, the cocktail of drugs he was taking was no longer effective. So his doctor had to go back to the drawing board and they had to come up with a whole new regimen. Um, so there's a huge mutation rate and we don't really have a cure for HIV because it is a virus that doesn't act like any other virus. You know, I mentioned to you earlier when we talked about vaccines, the typical vaccines are either live viruses that have been heat killed to the point that they can't replicate in your body or they are dead viruses. Um, that's tip, or sometimes it's like little viral proteins that we can get. And that's usually it for the types of vaccines until now with mRNA. Um, and so with HIV, they know the virus, um, they've isolated the virus, and they have taken that virus and they've killed it and they've given it to uh, monkeys. And every monkey developed HIV and died, uh, developed HIV, AIDS, and died, um, even with a killed virus. They've taken the virus and they've taken all of the viral genetic material out of the virus. So it's just a viral capsid, that's it. They give it to the monkeys, hoping that it would mount that primary immune response. Every single one of them developed HIV um, and AIDS and died. Um, so this is just a virus that doesn't act like any other virus that we've ever seen. Um, maybe now with mRNA vaccines, there is hope uh, for people who are HIV positive. Um, the treatment right now is lots of different drugs. So I have a lot of them listed up here. Anything from uh, protease inhibitors, fusion inhibitors, lots of different things that people might take. Um, there is, um, this is from your textbook, there's an antiretroviral vaginal gel that will reduce the risk of HIV transmission by 50%. However, there is something that will reduce the risk of HIV transmission by nearly 100%. And it's called a condom, and they're incredibly cheap to buy. I'm sure this antiretroviral gel is very expensive. So uh, I don't quite understand that one. Maybe you use it with condoms. I don't know. <laughs> um, autoimmune diseases um, are another thing that I do want to mention. We've talked about these a little bit. Um, this is basically when your immune system attacks your cell. It's not really able to distinguish what's your your own body tissue and what is a foreign tissue okay, or foreign antigen. And you start producing auto antibodies. So again, these are antibodies to your own cells and cytotoxic T cells that start destroying your own body's tissue. So here's a whole bunch of different examples. Um, type one diabetes. People who have type 1 diabetes have basically a non-functioning pancreas. So their pan pancreas does not function to create insulin. It's not working. And so the thought is that this is an autoimmune disease. Their immune system has essentially destroyed those islet cells within the pancreas. And it's no longer functioning to make um, insulin. Uh, lupus is another example of an autoimmune disease. Uh, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. So we have a whole list of them here. Rheumatoid arthritis, I know I talk about that in anatomy one, that is an autoimmune disease. So these are just some examples. So the treatment for an autoimmune disease pretty much is immunosuppressants, um, suppress your immune system. So steroids prevent inflammation so that your immune system, that third line of defense is not always being activated. 
blocking cytokine action. Remember, cytokines activate that third line of defense as well. And then even blocking co-stimulatory molecules. When we talk about our T cells, remember that double handshake. You got to turn the car on, you got to start the car, and then you got to put it in gear. If you can't put it in gear, can't activate those T cells, then they're not going to go kill off your own body cells. So these are some things, um, some treatments for autoimmune diseases. There really is no cure for an autoimmune disease. There's really just more treatments. Um, typically, anytime you have a T cell or a B cell that is self-reactive, it should have been eliminated from circulation during the maturation process. So for T cells, again, that's in the thymus. For B cells, that's in the bone marrow. So when they're becoming mature, they should be taken out of circulate. Well, they shouldn't even be put in circulation if they are self-reactive. But sometimes self-reactive lymphocytes can be activated. Um, one thing that might activate them would be, let's say you have been infected and the foreign antigen looks really similar to your self antigen. It's possible for an autoimmune disease to develop in that case. Sometimes uh, you might develop new self antigens because of a gene mutation or because you've gotten an infection or trauma. And so, um, you know, I hear a lot of stories about um, young kids who develop type 1 diabetes after they've had um, uh, an active infection, run high fevers, and that is not uncommon. Now, we also have some hypersensitivity. So this is when your immune system will respond to a perceived threat, but it's really something that's harmless. This can cause tissue damage. It can cause you to be really uncomfortable. You get the rash and the swelling and the hives, but it usually doesn't cause death. It just makes you really miserable. Um, and so the different types of hypersensitivities are distinguished by their time course and then whether antibodies or T cells are involved. If antibodies are involved, we say it's an immediate hypersensitivity. If T cells are involved, it's a delayed hypersensitivity. So let's talk about what those mean. So an acute hypersensitivity, these are allergies. These will happen very quickly, within seconds after you con come in contact with that allergen. Now, one thing I will mention, and I'll start this, your initial contact with an allergen you will have absolutely no symptoms, but you become sensitized. So the second time you come in contact with it, that's when you have a reaction. And it can be local or it can be all over your whole body. Okay, so let me show you an image of what's happening here. So the first time that you see an allergen, so this is our first response, the allergen gets into the body, your body sees it and goes, oh, that doesn't belong. So your plasma cells are going to start to mount an attack, and they're going to produce a type of antibody called an IgE antibody. These are the ones that play a huge role in allergies. IgE antibodies bind to mast cells. And that's it. You have no symptoms. This is just going on inside your body, and you don't know it. The second time you come in contact with that allergen, if it gets into your body, it's going to combine with those IgE antibodies that are attached to mast cell, which contain histamine, and you are going to release a ton of histamine. Histamine is the stuff that makes your eyes water, it makes your nose run, it makes your capillaries dilate, so you get red, sometimes you get itchy. This is why you take Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, right? So here's a picture that is showing you the primary and secondary response of an allergic reaction. Okay, so this is our primary response at the top. You can see that allergen gets in. It's really not harmful. Your body's just sort of overreacting. So it gets in, your plasma cells, your B cells recognize it. They make plasma cells. They make these IgE antibodies and those bind to mast cells. That's it. You don't release any histamine. So you don't even know that you came in contact with an allergen. The second time that gets in your body, now you can see those antibodies that are bound to mast cells immediately latch on. Histamine gets released into your uh, body and it causes all those nasty reactions 
the watery eyes, the runny nose, the itchy, the extra mucus, the sneezing, um, the constriction sometimes of the bronchial, so it makes it hard to breathe. Those are all things that come with an allergic reaction. So I remember when we were doing solid foods, um, they always tell you to introduce one type of food at a time to your baby. So you start maybe with um, pears and you give them pears and they eat pears for a week to make sure everything's okay. And then you give them something else, sweet potatoes, to make sure they're okay with that. But you never wanna introduce more than one just in case there is an allergic reaction. And I remember we have a history of peanut allergies in our family. So when I gave my son, he was, um, he was one and I let him have uh, some peanut butter. And I remember when I put peanut butter on a little cracker for him, I put it on his high chair and I was like, oh, how about it? And I went and did something else. I was like, he's totally fine because he's never had peanut butter. And the second time I gave him peanut butter, like I put that peanut butter cracker down and I was like, you okay? How's it going? <laughs> I watched him to make sure he didn't get a rash on his face, to make sure he didn't start feeling sick, just to make sure that he didn't have an allergic reaction. So again, I wasn't worried the first time. But the second time he came in contact is when I was worried. Now, in terms of those immediate hypersensitivities, the reactions you get, these are common with things like pollen, right? You're gonna get the runny nose, the itchy red skin, the watery eyes. If you inhale the allergen, your bronchioles might constrict. It'll restrict airflow, makes it kind of hard to breathe. If you eat the allergen, it can cause cramping, vomiting, diarrhea, bloody stools. There's all kinds of things. That's why I wanted to be on food poisoning and stuff like that. That's why I stuff happens because of, is it the food bad or is it the reaction? You mean with food poisoning? Yes. So food poisoning is actually bacterial growth on the food and that is causing that reaction. So that's not an allergic reaction that you're having. You're actually... A lot of times it's really nasty bacteria that's grown on the food. Like you're eating chicken that has expired that has bacterial growth on it. The heat did not kill. Um, yeah, that can be nasty. And you have a pretty violent reaction to that as well. Um, antihistamines like Benadryl will counteract all these reactions that I mentioned. However, if you have a systemic response, meaning if the allergen gets into your bloodstream. So think like people who are allergic to penicillin. They get a shot of penicillin. People who are allergic to things like bee venom, the bee stings them. If it goes into their bloodstream, it can cause anaphylactic shock. Okay? So that can cause things like the airway completely closing, the tongue swelling up. And at that point, it's just keeping the airway open, keeping the airway open so that a patient um, is still able to go through respiration. Um, a systemic response, if it gets into the blood and it circulates very quickly, um, the reaction that someone would have during anaphylactic shock is mast cells throughout the body flood that histamine. And all that histamine causes those bronchioles to basically shut and the tongue will swell. The other big issue is that vessels will dilate. So you'll go through what's called sudden vasodilation. So blood vessels get big. What happens to your blood pressure when your blood vessels get big? If blood vessels swell up and get big, blood pressure drops, okay? So if blood vessels get skinny and squeeze, your blood pressure goes up. But if blood vessels all dilate and get big, your blood pressure tanks. We call that circulatory collapse or hypoten hypotensive shock. That is just a drop, a sudden drop in your blood pressure you can't perfuse your tissues and that can lead to death. So this is why the treatment is epinephrine. Epinephrine actually helps increase your heart rate to keep your blood pressure high enough. Now some delayed hypersensitivities, this just means it takes a little while for you to see um, the reaction. It's not gonna be immediate. So this would be like you come in contact with um, maybe some detergent and you break out in a rash, but it might take you a day or two. Or poison ivy usually takes a day or two. Um, and so these are delayed hypersensitivities. Um, and so what's happening is that allergen is, a, is acting like a haptin. Um, so let me show you. Oh, did we talk about haptins already? I think we did. These are just um, little fragments. Um, these are really small fragments by themselves, they don't cause a problem, but when they 
bind with bigger proteins and molecules in your skin, that's when they do cause a problem. So we talked about those at the start of 21, this chapter. Um, the tuberculosis skin test relies on this reaction. So this is where they put that little bubble under your skin and they're waiting to see if it swells up to see if those little hot tens are creating a molecule that your body recognizes as foreign. The last couple of things I'll mention is just how your immune system develops. Um, the stem cells for your immune system develop in your liver and your spleen very early on in embryonic development. Um, and then eventually your bone marrow will take over and they will, your bone marrow is responsible for the hematopoietic stem cells for the rest of your life. Um, lymphocyte development continues in your bone marrow and your thymus, where they become mature, depending on the lymphocyte we're talking about. Helper T cells predominate in a newborn. And remember, your immune system has to be educated, meaning that as you encounter these foreign antigens, you make memory. So the next time you see it, you fight it off before you even know you were sick. And so your immune system has to be educated. You have to build your immune system. Um, things that can influence your immune system, depression, emotional stress, grief, all of these things can lower your immune system. So when I was an undergrad, I, we were on quarters. Um, and every year when I would come home at Christmas time, it was right after finals, just like here, but right after finals. And I would always be sick. I would always get sick because stress lowers your immune response. And it's much easier for you to get sick um, if your immune response is lowered. So there's a lot of things that can really lower your immune response. Another one is diet. So I hear a lot of people, even my neighbors with COVID, they were talking about taking all these multivitamins that help with the immune system, like vitamin C and zinc and all these things. And so I told my neighbor, you can take all of that. I mean, it's not going to hurt you um, unless it's a fat soluble vitamin. Otherwise, it's no big deal. You'll pee out the extra. The only one that has actually been proven scientifically to help with your immune system is vitamin D. Vitamin D is required for, for cytotoxic T cells to become activated. So if you are deficient in vitamin D, your immune system uh, will be suppressed. So we know that vitamin D supplements can help to reduce flu and um, vitamin D deficiency is linked to some um, autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis. Now, as you get older, your immune system will start to wane. Um, you are much more susceptible to autoimmune diseases and immunodeficiencies, greater incidence of cancer, especially sun-linked skin cancer. We don't really know why the immune system fails. Remember your thymus gland atrophies as you age. So it could be related to that, um, but we don't really know. 